Uh, first, before I get into some of the uh, you know, document, uh, you know, presentation and documentation of what we have on some of these samples. I just wanted to do a brief overview of each of these. So starting with agent Tesla. Uh, so what we actually have on the, the picture here is just a quick screenshot of, you know, obviously you can see virus total with uh, our comments on that. So because of VMRA's uh, kind of behavior-based analysis and other detections that we have tied into it, we can be some of the first to to comment on a lot of these before even uh, virus total is able. Or a lot of the vendors are able to uh, find this as malicious, so it's because we're able to get a lot of you know, new or unknown samples to find malicious based off all these behaviors and other detection methodologies. And for Agent Tesla specifically, this is a spyware that's been around since 2014. It's in active development and it's constantly being updated with you know, improved and, and new features and different obfuscation and encryption techniques. Uh, this malware is actually sold as a service. So it's a relatively cheap licensing model and it makes it pretty easy for attackers to, to use and why it has such a, a wide scale distribution. Now it's most common and successful delivery method is via email, typically in the form of you know, spam or more targeted campaigns uh, where malware is bundled as attachment. And it's usually in the form of a document or a compressed archive. Now, how that relates to uh, some of the TTPs that uh, Fatu was showing earlier. So these will be highlighted in blue. Here, again, it's focused mostly on the defensive evasion side of things, uh, sort additional credential access, and also, again, uh, collection stealing. Uh, that's what uh, Agent Tesla will be doing within this, and we'll be showing within our reporting as well. Then with Cobalt Strike, again, similarly, we have a, a comment here where, again, we're the first to comment on this with uh, even a lower virus total score on, on this one as well. Uh, and again, this is you know, a commercial you know, hack tool. Uh, and it's a spinoff of the Armitage product. So it's, you know, it's a commercially available or a hack tool or toolkit that's going to combine multiple software tools and its beacon payload. And each release of Cobalt Strike, it's typically creating a new and unique beacon payload. So that's something that uh, you're constantly having to find new ways to detect that particular payload, because in general, uh, this is a pretty silent attack that, that we're seeing from there. So it's, you know, it's intended for security teams and specifically red teams to evaluate their own infra infrastructure against APTs. Uh, but it can also be leveraged by insiders to against you know already comp compromised machines as well. And uh, all the older versions of Cobalt Strike have also been leaked. Uh, and it can, these can be manipulated by, by actors to distribute additional payloads afterwards. And so it's tax against companies. Cobalt Strike often starts with stealing data and then ends with deploying something you know nastier, such as ransomware. And then it, since it gives it uh, endless options because really you can deploy anything after after it uh, gains access to that system. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's now exfiltration of data or again, ransomware deployment, and since it also functions as a backdoor and a loader, it really can transfer access to anyone else within the uh, uh, outside of the organization. And then again, focusing on the TTP here, TTPs here again, uh, obviously you can see there's a, a lot more that will tie into insider threats that we can see there, whether it's just uh, initial access and execution, uh, also just persistence, uh, as we mentioned briefly there, uh, ev uh, defensive evasion to bypass different security controls, uh, discovery of the environment, and also lateral movement, which is important uh, for how it stays so silent within, within the organization. And now we'll get into the actual demonstration of our product and analyzing each of these uh, malware tools. And so here we're, we're able to take a look at just what our dynamic analysis report will look like. Uh, so this is going to uh, kind of within the analysis reports, it's going to be showing uh, a lot of information that we have on those details to be leveraged by uh, both the uh, uh, by anyone, whether it's the threat hunters or incident responders, to get information off the, this malware. So whether it's just basic network information or file data, but also at the top, you can see information that tied directly to what this malware is, whether it's specific malware families, or at a higher level, 
We can also look at classifications, such as whether it's a backdoor or keylogger. And that type of information is tied directly to some of the threat identifiers or behaviors that we tie to them. So whether it's you know, modern keyboard input or setting up uh, incoming communications or both keylogger and backdoor. We also see other methods that use for evasion to try to be dormant for almost five minutes there. And we can also look at the modern process to see how this reacts with the environment, including how the process are relating to each other. And here we see injection into itself, and that's a pretty common tactic for malware to evade static detection. And that's something we can call out here within the, the VTI rules that we see, where it's modifying memory of a, another process and other anti-analysis techniques to evade hooking-based sandboxes or just other obfuscation techniques that we have there. Now, what an analyst can do with here is actually leverage these to, to look at some of the information. So you can use this to, to drill into the injected process behavior and look at some of the injection information, whether it's just looking at uh, for each type of injection and the source process, uh, source and target uh, uh, information there, uh, also whether it's successful or not. And then most usefully, you can actually jump into the uh, function log file itself to get a lot more detailed information on that particular injection. So you're able to, to look at a lot of detail there and even download that full function log uh, to get that data or even jump into the data that was actually injected into that process. Now, also within this behavior tab, you can see there's a lot more operations that we're able to grab from that dynamic analysis, uh, whether it's, and here there's a lot of information, whether it's just machine information that's gathering or browser data. And all of this is also going to be called out in those VTIs. Uh, so you could use it to, to go the other way to the VTIs to that behavior, but here, we can also just show you how, how this behavior uh, relates to this. So we can see whether it's uh, sensitive browser information that's being read from there, where it can read all the you know, various uh, you know, Chrome or Mozilla that, that's looking for there, uh, mail data. We can also see application FTP data below that. So it's a lot of different instances of data collection, which maybe individually any of these behaviors are just considered malicious. But for us, since we're seeing such a, a, a mass amount of them, that's where we have this kind of aggregate rule set that ties to each one of these to say it's malicious behavior. So that's where even without the detection directly to uh, Agent Tesla in this case, we can see that it's spyware just off those. And there's other methods and uh, behaviors that, we, that tie into that, where it's also we have an aggregate rule for discovery. Uh, where we can see it's querying OS information, uh, WMI queries, uh, again, whether it's sensitive browser information, hardware properties, so all those tie into uh, other information that Agent Tesla is collecting on that machine, but also potentially stealing out of it. Uh, so that that's all the, the data that we're able to see for discovery. Uh, and even you can see even below that, there's an additional data collection uh, rule here that ties to the actual keylogger and exfiltration of data. And so that's, again, probably pretty easy there. You can see the uh, uh, keyboard input that's being collected, but also some of the network connection information where that's setting up incoming connections for a backdoor, but also connecting to remote host um, and others, other network connections. So again, uh, on its own, not necessarily uh, malicious, but probably pretty suspicious. And you can look into more of that behavior here as well to see how it's going about collecting that keyboard input. So you can use that uh, to search for if there's any other uh, instances of that on uh, user machines or other behaviors they're seeing in the logging data. Now, other pieces for some like persistence is you can see what act, what uh, process you know uh, added a you know particular file to the startup via registry, and then use that to get, again go to that behavior to see more details. So you can really see again looking at some of the logging data: is this occurring on anyone else's system that maybe you didn't catch this earlier in the process? And so that's all just kind of the general behavior that we see uh, for Agent Tesla here, but it's not tying directly to Agent Tesla. So how do we go about doing that? And that's going to be matching to uh, more of the uh, detections and, and matching that we have here, both for Yara and antivirus detection. And you see there's a, quite a number of those matches here uh, where it can tie directly to Agent Tesla or as other detections that we see on the AV matches. And for the YAR rules, this is a, a huge component of some of the data classification that we see here. And if you map more than just the, the files themselves, here we have see memory dumps and also web requests. And we can, if we're interested, and here we can actually dive into the rule set. So I'll just copy that to actually so we can search it within here. And 
when we do that, we can see all the different ways that it's going to be uh, matching off that rule set. So the YAR rules are a huge way to detect something, even if it's something uh, you know that maybe you don't see all the, these behaviors that we saw earlier to detect them as much as, but here uh, we see you know some of the scoring that we have on it and who, who authored it, uh, and then all the various strings that can be used to match to this particular rule set. And, and so all of this information is useful for an analyst to see what you can do to you know uh, be able to to match this and be able to create uh, powerful detections as well within your own environment, what it can be, you know, what it can match to, in this case, memory dump, and then what the conditions of that. So it needs at least four of those strings to match for that rule set to hit. And that's really useful information. You can also use that to drill into uh, our process memory dumps. So what this matched on, and you can see and here, we have both an AV and a YAR rule match. You could use this to, to download that memory dump just for other information you might want to gather on that. Uh, or you can download some of the other memory dumps and see if there's anything else that might match to Agent Tesla uh, that you see there that maybe you don't have a rule set created for yet and you can build out your own. Or another useful technique is we can also extract out the strings from the function calls, which you'll see here. And so this, we can just give you a list of all the various uh, strings that we see within those. And then that could also be used to map to different malware families. Uh, so again, a lot of different areas that we can that we with a uh, dynamic analysis can can get information on those to help with some of the detection and classification of the malware beyond just some of the behavior that we see there and beyond just matching off files. But there's a lot of data that can be used to match. And from there, uh, once it does get a particular malware family, we can also use that to search for certain malware configurations. And here we can see that, or again, you could download the configuration or uh, just what we have within the UI is we can see that it's able to, to get some metadata around that. And this can be used for additional IOC uh, extraction that we have here. So we can tie that into uh, not just all the artifacts that are collected throughout the analysis that might see the network behavior, but also here, we can relate this URL directly to uh, the extracted configuration. So that aids with some of, uh, some of the uh, uh, collection that we have there. And all of those VTIs that we have will then map to different artifacts. And if there's matches there, that's what we're actually filtering out to be considered an IOC versus a total artifact. So again, really much more helpful than just giving you, you know, over 200 artifacts. But here we're just saying 17 of these are more relevant to the information you may want to extract out of there. Now here, just jumping in the Cobalt Strike report, and this obviously is, uh, you'll, you'll see here, there's a lot less uh, behavior that we see from that. And it's because, again, Cobalt Strike is intended to be pretty silent, but also we don't have any additional payload that's, that's executed afterwards. So it's just a single process that we see here. Uh, and then in terms of the actual behavior, uh, again, you're not seeing a ton of information, even just from this dynamic analysis. You see different um, anti-analysis techniques. So again, we see that it's sleeping this time a lot longer, over 15 hours that's trying to be dormant within the system. Now we're able to speed that up within the analysis to, to see it within this framework, but we can call that out just uh, as a behavior rule since it's sleeping for, for more than five minutes. Uh, but other techniques we see, it's both trying to evade and detect debuggers. So again, from different static analysis detections that we have there, or just trying to see if it's inside a virtual machine to see if it should run or not. Uh, so that's, uh, again, just other ways that our researchers use to, to evaluate this malware. So it's trying to be hidden from, from that analysis. But in general, that's not necessarily malicious. Most of the malicious behavior here is tied to reputation data, antivirus. Again, we can see the YAR rule detections from this. And so this, again, just highlights how important that is because we don't have a ton of behavior to be able to uh, see whether or not this is uh, malicious just based off that. Here, we, we actually need to go into that and see whether, again, we map to a particular uh, configuration that we're able to, to get out of that. And we can use this, to, again, to, to download that map, or we can go to the R matches here. Uh, you can use this to drill all over, uh, all over this report. And here, we're detecting the beacon itself. Uh, so that's really the most important piece is when, when this is released is trying to find different ways to detect uh, this beacon for Cobalt Strike so that you're able to then uh, connect to it, uh, be able to, to map it. But then also within the configuration, you can see there's a ton of IOC data 
they're able to extract out of this um, that can help you detect this in the future with other tools. And so that's that's what's most useful about this is not necessarily, again, the behaviors might not necessarily get this to be malicious, but again, tying this directly to uh, the beacon itself and then using that to get threat intelligence out of, so you're able to see that behavior other, uh, otherwise. All right, and with that, I'll pass you back to, to Fatih for uh, any closing remarks here.